The Criminal Child by John Janet. No. I was offered time on French radio, on a program called Carte Blanche. I said yes so I could speak of criminal childhood. My text, which was initially accepted by Mr. Fernand Pouillet, has just been rejected. Instead of pride, I feel some shame about this. I would have liked to make the voice of the criminal audible. Not his plaint, rather his song of glory. A vain need to be sincere stopped me from this but to be sincere less due to the exactitude of facts than because of obedience to the somewhat raucous accents, the only ones that could communicate my feelings, my truth, the feelings and truth of my friends. The newspapers were already stunned that a stage was offered to a burglar and a queer, so I cannot speak into the national mic. I repeat that I am ashamed. I should have remained in the night, though at the edge of day, and now I move back into the shadows from which I tried so hard to tear myself. The speech you will read here was written to be heard. I publish it anyway, but with no hope of it being read by those I love. On the radio, I wanted to precede it with a cross-examination administered by me of a judge, a prison warden, and an official psychiatrist. They all refused to appear. Oh, those beautiful boys, pinks and queens and criminals. Oh, those beautiful boys, tattoos of ships and tattoos of tears. The Criminal Child. Let everyone understand well, and excuse my emotion, as I must now disclose an adventure that was also my own. To the mystery that you are, I must oppose and unveil the mystery of children's prisons. Spread out in the French countryside, often in the most elegant part, there are some places that will never cease to fascinate me. These are the penitentiaries whose official and overly polite title is currently Youth Club for Moral Improvement, Re-Education Center, Delinquent Children's Recovery House, etc. The change of title is already a sign. The expression reformatory and sometimes penitentiary, having become a sort of proper name, or to be more precise, designating an ideal and cruel place situated deep in the child's heart, has a violence that the educators have tried to weaken. However, I hope that the children secretly, and despite terminology which reveals a fairly laughable hygiene, heed the call of the penitentiary or the prison. But let the children now place them in a moral region, more than in a definite place. It's stupid to attack the name, thinking that the idea of the named thing will change, since this thing is, dare I say, alive, as it is made by movement alone, just by the coming and going of the most creative element, the delinquent or criminal children. I want to repeat that this corner of the world, bearing one of the titles cited above, has its reflection, its image even, its home, and the soul of the children. I will come back to this soon. Saint Maurice, Saint Hilaire. Belle-Île, Is, Anion, Montesson, Mitre. These are some names that are perhaps nothing to you. In the head of every child who has just committed an offense or a crime, they are the definitive projection of their destiny. I've been sentenced to the 21, they say. They purposely made a mistake, since the sentence of the tribunal that judges them is as follows. Acquitted as having acted without discernment, and entrusted until adulthood to the patronage of recovery. But the young criminal already refuses the indulgence and solicitude of being understood in this way by a society against which he has revolted by committing his first crime. Having, at fifteen or sixteen, or even earlier, come of age in a way that decent people will still not have done at sixty, he holds their kindness in contempt. But he demands that his punishment be without gentleness, First of all, he demands that the terms defining it bear the sign of a greater cruelty. It's with a sort of shame that the child confesses that they have just acquitted him, or that they have condemned him to a light sentence. He wishes for rigor. He demands it. Inside, he holds on to the dream that it will take the form of a terrible hell, that the prison will be the corner of the world from which you don't come back. In fact, you didn't come back. When you came back, you were someone else. You had come across a blazing fire, and the names that I mentioned earlier are not just any names. They are charged with meaning, with the weight of a terror that children exaggerate even more. 
Now these names are the proof of their violence, their force, and their virility, for it is indeed that which children will conquer. Their demand is that the ordeal be terrible, so as, perhaps, to exhaust an impatient need for heroism. Mitzvé. In my youth, it was among the most prestigious names. Under the blows of a generous imbecile, Mitzvé is gone. Today it is an agricultural colony, I think, but then it was a severe place. After his arrival in this fortress of bay trees and flowers, Mitzvé was not enclosed by walls. The young outlaw who, from then on, was known as a colonist, was the object of a thousand forms of care destined to prove to him his criminal success. He was enclosed in a cell painted entirely in black, even the ceiling. Then he was dressed in an outfit known in the region for the dread and ignominy it evoked. Then, and throughout his stay, the colonists faced other tests. Brawls, often mortal, that billy clubs never disturbed, dormitory hammocks, silences during work and meals, ridiculously pronounced prayers, punishments in the barracks, clogs, scorched feet, marching in the sun at a measured pace, the bowl of cold water, etc. We knew all that at Mitzke, to which, as echoes respond, the torture of the pit at Belial responded, as in other colonies, the grave, the tomb, the empty bowl, the barracks, the play of barrels, and the discipline room responded. High schools and elementary schools have their discipline, which could seem just as severe, just as pitiless to sensible natures. We would answer that schools are not made by children, they are made for them. As for penitentiaries, they are really the physical projection of the desire for severity buried in the hearts of young criminals. I would not impute these cruelties that I enumerated to the directors or guardians of yesteryear. They were but the attentive, ferocious, but also conscious witnesses, witnesses of their role as adversaries. These cruelties had to be born and developed by necessity from the ardor of the children for evil. Evil, I mean just this will, this audacity to follow a destiny opposed to all the rules. The criminal child is one who has forced to open a door opening onto a forbidden place. He wants this door to open up to the loveliest landscape in the world. He demands that the penal colony that he has earned be ferocious, worthy in the end of the evil he has granted himself so as to conquer it. For some year now, well-meaning men are trying to make all this kinder and gentler. They hope, and sometimes succeed, in winning souls over to society. To return us, so they say, to the straight path. Fortunately, the reforms are on the surface. They will only change the form. But what have they done? They've given the guard the new name of Monitor. They've also dressed him in a uniform that is supposed to remind one less of prison guards. They've required him to use less physical violence and insults, and forbidden the use of blows. Inside this patronage, they've made discipline gentler. They've given to those they call the re-educated the possibility of choosing a trade. They've granted more freedom in work and play. Children can talk amongst themselves, even addressing the warders or the director. Sports has a privileged place. saint Hilaire's soccer teams are matched against those of neighboring towns, and sometimes the players travel alone from one town to the other. The press is tolerated at the patronage. Always a pre-selected press, a purified one. The food is better. There's chocolate on Sunday mornings. Finally, the measure that ought to complete the effectiveness of the reforms. Argo is banned there. In sum, young criminals are granted a life closer to the most banal life. It's called regeneration. Society seeks to eliminate or render harmless the elements that tend to corrode it. It would seem that it wants to diminish the moral distance between the misdeed and the punishment, or really, the passage from the misdeed to the idea of punishment. This attempt at castration speaks for itself. It doesn't move me in the least. In fact, though the colonists at Saint-Hilaire or Belle-Ile lead a life that appears to be similar to that of a school of apprentices, they cannot be ignorant of what it is that gathers them here, in this particular place. And because it is a guarded secret, never exhaled, this reason inflates each intention in each child. The usual argo which has been forbidden has been replaced by another, even more subtle, which through the workings of a mechanism that I cannot explain here in front of this mic, overtakes the argo of Mitzke. As Saint-Hilaire, one of the ones I had brought out of his shell, said to me one day, When I said to you that the friend saved himself, 
don't tell the director that I said that he doed. He had come out with the word. It was the same one that we used to use at Mitzke to name the kid who gets away, saves himself. The one the villagers see running in the woods like a doe. I had just been informed of a secret language, more knowing than the one they were trying to ban, and I asked myself whether it wasn't being used to express feelings that were hidden with too much precaution. The educators had a salvationist naivete and his kindness of soul. One day the director of one of the patronages showed me in his desk a panoply he seemed proud of, about twenty knives taken from the kids. Mr. Janet, he said to me, the administration makes me take these knives from them, so I do it. But look at them. Are you going to tell me that they are dangerous? They're made of tin. Tin! You can't kill anyone with that. Did he not know that? The more it deviates from its practical destination, the more the object is transformed, becoming a symbol. Even its form changes sometimes. You might say it's stylized. That is how it acts, in a muffled way. In the souls of children, it does the most terrible things. Buried under a straw mattress at night, or hidden in the fold of a jacket, of a pair of pants above all. Not for comfort, but so that it can lay besides the organ of which it is the deep symbol. It is the very sign of the murder that the child will not actually commit, but which will render his fantasies fecund and lead them, so I hope, towards the most criminal manifestations. So what is the point of taking it from him? The child will choose another object to signify murder, something apparently more benign. And if someone doesn't take that as well, he'll keep in himself, preciously, the more precise image of the weapon. The same director showed me the scout team he formed to reward the most docile children. I saw a dozen young boys, furtive and ugly, who had let themselves fall into the trap of good intentions. They sang ridiculous road songs that were far from the evocative power of the sentimental or obscene plaints sung at night in the dormitories and cells. Looking at these twelve kids, it was clear that none of them was chosen, elected, so as to take on some audacious expedition even an entirely imaginary one. But I knew that in the interior of the penitentiary, in spite of the educators, there existed groups, gangs really, where the bond, what made them stick together, was friendship, audacity, ruse, insolence, a taste for laziness, an air about the forehead at once somber and joyful, this taste for adventure against the rules of the good. I will excuse myself from using a language apparently more precise than my own. Please consider that I am looking to define a moral attitude and to justify it. I recognize that above all I want to interpret it, and to do so against you. But aren't you yourselves the first to speak of the power of the shadows, of the dark power of evil? You don't back away from metaphor when it can convince. Now I find in it a more effective use when I speak of the nocturnal part of man, which you cannot explore, which you cannot enter unless you are armed unless you are coated, embalmed, unless you are covered with all the ornaments of language. But above all, when someone tries to do the good, let's note that I'm distinguishing quite rapidly between good and evil, though in fact these are categories that may only be distinguished after the fact. However, I'm still speaking to you. I grant you this politeness. If someone tries, I was saying, to do the good, one knows where one is going and what the good is and that sanction will do good. When it's evil, no one knows what they are talking about anymore, but I know it is the only thing that can arouse the verbal enthusiasm beneath my pen, the sign here of the allegiance of my heart. In fact, I don't know of any other criterion for the beauty of an act, an object, or an entity than the song it arouses in me, which I translate into words so as to communicate it to you. This is lyricism. If my song is lovely, it has upset you. Will you dare say that he who inspired it is vile? You can say that there have always been words charged with expressing the haughtiest attitudes, and that I would have recourse to them so as that the least appears haughty. But I can respond that my emotion calls for precisely these words, and that they come naturally to serve it. So, if your soul is low, call the movement that carries the child of fifteen to an offense or a crime thoughtlessness. I will use another word, for you need a ferocious nerve, a lovely courage to stand against a society this strong, institutions this severe, laws protected by a police whose strength is as much in the fabulous, mythical, 
unformed fear that it installs in the souls of children as it is in its organization. What leads them to crime is the storybook feeling, that is to say, a self-projection into the most magnificent, the most audacious, ultimately the most perilous of lives. I translate for them, for they have the right to use a language that helps them to venture out. Where, do you think? I don't know. They don't know either, even if their reveries seek precision, but it's beyond your spaces. And I wonder if you don't follow them out of spite because they hold you in contempt and abandon you. I expect nothing of you. This whole time I haven't been speaking to the educators, but to the guilty. For society, in its favor, I don't want to invent some new device for it to protect itself. I will tell it a secret. It will know well, all by itself, how to protect itself from the graceful danger of criminal children. I speak to them. I ask them to never be embarrassed by what they do, to keep intact inside themselves the revolt that has made them so beautiful. There are no remedies, I hope, for heroism. But be careful. If among the decent people who are listening, there are some who haven't changed the station, let them know that they have to take their shame, the infamy of being beautiful souls, all the way. Let them swear to be bastards all the way to the end. They will be cruel so as to further sharpen a cruelty with which the children will shine, resplendent. Whoever, by gentleness or privileges, tries to attenuate or abolish revolt, destroys any chance of salvation. And no one can forgive crime if he is not first guilty and condemned. These sorts of aphorisms seem to just come up, aroused by the lyricism I was talking about earlier. I grant it. I pronounce them with the support of just one authority, the pain that I would undergo if I had to say the opposite. And you, what do you use to support your moral rules? So let a poet, who is also an enemy, speak to you as a poet and as an enemy. The only means that great persons, honest people, have of safeguarding some sort of moral beauty is to refuse all pity to the kids who don't want any. Do not believe then, ladies and gentlemen, that it is enough for you to incline towards the criminal child with care and indulgence, with a comprehensive interest, to have a right to his affection and his gratitude. You must be this child. You must also be the crime, and sanctify it with a magnificent life. That is to say, with the audacity of breaking with the all-powerfulness of the world. Once we are divided, after us, the ones who desired it, who dared this rupture, between the not guilty, I do not say innocence, between the not guilty, who you are, and the guilty, who we are, know that it is an entire life that you are leading from this side of the bars, from where you think you can, without any danger, and for your own moral comfort, hold out to us a helping hand. As for me, I have chosen. I will be on the side of crime, and I will help the children not to win back access to your houses, your factories, your schools, your laws and sacraments, but to destroy them. Alas, I fear I no longer have that virtue, since due to what is not solely an error on the part of the organizers of this talk, the chance to speak on the radio is too easily granted to me. The newspapers still show photographs of bodies overflowing in silos or littering the plains, caught in the barbed wire brambles, in the cremation ovens. They show nails torn off, skin tattooed, tan for lampshades. These are the Hitlerian crimes. But what nobody realizes is that in the children's penal colonies, in French prisons, children and men are martyred by torturers. It doesn't matter if some are innocent and others guilty in the eyes of either a superhuman or merely human justice. In the eyes of the Germans, the French were guilty. We were so mistreated in prison, and in such a cowardly manner, that I am jealous of you and your tortures. For it's similar to and better than what we do. Due to the effects of heat, the plant has flourished. Since it was planted by the bourgeois who made the stone prisons with their guards of flesh and spirit, I rejoice to finally see the sower devoured. Decent men, who are today golden names in marble, applauded when we were cuffed at the wrists, while a cot beat our sides. One little flick from their henchmen was vivified by the boiling blood of the heroes of the north. It developed until it became a marvelous plant beautiful in tact and skill, a rose whose petals were twisted, rolled up, showing the red and the pink under a hellish sun, and named with terrible names. Maidanek, Belsen, Auschwitz, Mauthausen, Dora. My hat goes off. 
but we'll go on being your remorse, and for no other reason than to once more embellish our adventure, because we know that its beauty depends on the distance that separates us from you. For in the place we'll reach, I know it, the shores aren't different, but we'll make you out on your well-angered beaches, little, slender, angry. We'll sense your impotence and your benedictions. Besides, rejoice! If the malicious, the cruel, represent the force against which you fight, we wish to be this force of evil. We will be the matter that resists and without which there are no artists. A bunch of romantic talk, you say. Now I know that the morality in whose name you pursue the children is not one you ever apply. I don't blame you for this. Your merit consists in professing principles that tend to govern your life. But you have too little force to give yourself over freely and entirely to virtue, or to evil. You preach one and disavow the other, from which you nevertheless profit. I acknowledge your practical sense. Alas, I can't sing it. Now accuse me of lyricism. But if it happens that one of your judges, a clerk of the court, or a prison warden makes a song hatch and rise up in my chest, gentlemen, you'll be the first to know. Your literature, your fine arts, your after-dinner entertainment all celebrate crime. The talent of your poets has glorified the criminal who, in life, you hate. So deal with the fact that, for our part, we despise your poets and your artists. Today we can say that an actor needs a rare presumptuousness to pretend to commit murder on the stage, when every day there are children and men whose crimes, even if it doesn't always lead them to their deaths, grants them your spite or your delicate pardon. Each of these criminals has come to terms with his act. He needs to pull together all the resources of his moral life, which he must organize around himself. He must obtain from it what yours refuses him. For him, and for him alone, and for a very brief time, since you have the power to cut off his head, he becomes a hero as lovely as those who touch you in your books. To continue to live with himself, if he lives, he needs more talent than the rarest poet. Your heroes, though, the ones that fill your books, your tragedies, your poems, and your paintings, are puffed up. They get to be the ornaments of your life while you hold their unhappy models in contempt. You are doing it right. They refuse you the hand you hold out. If those who are listening saw the film Shusha, they were moved by the delicate play of feelings among children tied to one another by the most subtle of loves. They admired an adventure that they dare not live, but no one would ever think that such charming heroes exist in real life, that they steal real banknotes from their real parents. True, what is called the talent of actors has afforded us such lovely images. However, those who were their more or less exact models suffered for real. They bled, they cried less often, and the glory of the world was denied them. You therefore support heroism when it is tame. I will note it in passing that your charmers, your artists, tame it for you, by always approaching it from afar. You know nothing of heroism in its true nature, in the flesh, how it suffers in the same everyday way that you do. True greatness brushes past you. You ignore it and prefer a fate. So if children have the audacity to say no to you, punish them. Be hard with them so they don't go easy on you. But after long enough, you will cheat. At your tribunals, your courts, you will no longer observe the ceremony of the ritual, not that you have replaced it with a more intimate cruelty, a cruelty in a suit, I dare say, but due to a grave sloppiness, you arrive at the courtroom with a patched-up robe whose cups are sometimes not even silk, but rayon or cotton luster. You should apply all the rules of the code, and above all the most formalist. The criminal child no longer believes in your dignity, for he has realized that it was made of a faded sleeve, a tattered braid, a threadbare fur. The luxury, dust, and poverty of your sessions upsets him. He is ready to offer you the little bit of majesty that he can obtain from a more solemn session, where he secretly appears as you continue what to his eyes is a childish simulation. For a moment, familiarity might lead you to touch his cheek, grasp his chin. If you do not fear that someone would accuse you, not of paternal indulgence, but of abominable sentiments. But I'm just talking, right? And my humor is a little much for you. You're sure that you will save these children. Fortunately, you will never be able to oppose anything to the beauty of the older rogues they admire, to the ferocious murderers, other than ridiculous watchmen, 
squeezed into poorly cut and ill-fitting uniforms. None of your functionaries can take the children and make them succeed in the adventure they themselves have begun. Nothing will replace the seduction of the outlaws. For the criminal act has more importance than any other, since it's the one through which you oppose yourself to such a great moral and physical force. You also believe in the beauty of Vashi, of Weidman, of Anasolei. I rise up against this affirmation. Quote, that there were in them marvelous possibilities that one could have taken the side of. End quote. That is a language that can only be yours, that of society. But you would truly be in pain if I rigorously interrogated you. They have drawn out of themselves those most marvelous possibilities. If you can't conquer the children with gentleness, what's left for you is to heal them, since you have psychiatrists. If you can't conquer the children with gentleness, what's left for you is to heal them, since you have psychiatrists. About them, it's enough to pose some simple questions, questions that have been posed hundreds of times. If their function is to modify the moral behavior of children, what morality will they lead them to? The one taught in school manuals? But scientists don't take that seriously. Some particular morality elaborated by each doctor? Whence does he draw his authority? What good are these questions? They will be conjured away. I know that it's the usual morality, and the psychiatrist invokes it when he gives the children the lovely name of maladjusted. How can I respond? I will always oppose my ruse to your trickery. Today, since it has been allowed through I don't know what error, for a poet who was once one of theirs to speak into this mic, I want to reiterate my tenderness for these little pitiless youths. However, I have no illusions. I speak in the void and in the darkness, but even if it were just for myself, I would still want to insult the insulters. Burn your legitimately to a heart most likely. He became an orphan, a wood love. Orphan he was sent to the reformatory Ten years old was his first glory Got caught stealing from a nun Now his love story had begun Notes on the Criminal Child The Criminal Child has, until now, never appeared in its entirety in the English language. Such a remarkable oversight, remarkable because it concerns a writer as significant as Jean Genet, would be reason enough for us to render a translation and bring it to print. But, in reading it, reasons far beyond the bibliophilic impulse reveal themselves and insist on the urgency, timeliness, and import of this text. Though never read on air, Genet intended L'Enfant Criminel as a radio address. Fernand Pouy, the director of dramatic and literary broadcast for French radio, solicited Genet to speak on his radio program, Carte Blanche, in 1948, as a bit of commentary on proposed reforms to France's youth prisons. Around the same time, Pouy also commissioned Antonin Artaud to broadcast Pour finir avec le jugement de Dieu. Both pieces were censored by the powers that be. 
A small edition of Genet's text was published the next year, and was then all but forgotten. Genet was asked to give commentary on the issue, the youth prisons, because of his own time spent in the institutions in question. Two years prior, he published his novel, Miracle of the Rose, which recounted his own experiences in Maitre, a penal colony for youth. Maitre was Genet's teenage home for roughly two and a half years, interrupted only briefly by a short-lived escape, beginning in, in 1926. By the time it was closed in 1939, it had functioned for a century as an agricultural colony, modeled on the German Rohhaus, or Houses of the Wild, where delinquent children were supposed to be reformed to learn discipline and morality through forced agricultural labor. The presence of Maitre and its reformatory failures permeates Miracle of the Rose, the criminal child and Genet's whole body of work. Whereas his entire life he was an outsider, a sissy, a dreamer, a reader, a delinquent, at Maitre he was a thief among thieves, an outcast among many, an amorous youth admired by the older toughs of the colony. Something began for Genet at Maitre. He attests to a creative impulse born in himself at the penal colony. Quote, if to write means that you feel emotions or feelings so strong that your whole life is shaped by them, if they're so strong that only by describing or evoking or analyzing them can you understand them. If so, then it was at Maitre that I started when I was 15. It was then I started to write. Nowhere in Genet's writing do we find penance or reform. There is no assimilation or reconciliation at the end of his tales. He remained true to Maitre and to his delinquent youth. The criminal child is his pledge of illicit allegiance. The stance that Genet intended to take in his radio address is remarkable because it throws a wrench into the neat periodization with which some, such as Adrienne Laroche, have tried to organize his thinking. Laroche's book, The Final Genet, begins with Genet in 1968, crossing the Strait of Gibraltar, entering the occupied Sorbonne, encountering Maoists and Palestinian combatants, and shortly thereafter writing his quote-unquote first political text. Laroche posits that after this point, Genet's political turn, he concerns himself with quote, man and his experience. And yet here, two decades prior to this supposed turn, we read Genet intervening in a political question, but refusing to play the game on its terms. Those familiar with his post-1968 writings will recognize this mode of refusal, poetic, magical, and distinctly anti-political. His refusal to be periodized likewise undermines the role fashioned for him by the left. He disrupts the fantasy of a transition from the first criminal, Genet, to the last revolutionary, Genet. This text thickens the consistency between the supposedly distinct early and late not to mention the criminal and insurgent works of Genet. Something remains invariant in all imagined periods, his hostility. Regarding Genet's hostility toward attempted reforms, it is noteworthy that he wrote this address in the same year prominent artists and writers such as Couteau, Sartre, Colette, and Picasso were formally petitioning the state to pardon his past crimes. They insisted that his work tore him away from his past reformed him, and that a pardon was necessary to secure his reformation. And so, in The Criminal Child, we find an affirmation of crime and a condemnation of bourgeois art at the very same time that his crimes are to be forgiven for art's sake. Through these words, he takes a side, swears an oath to his past, to crime, makes a declaration of enmity toward the society in which he lived. Edmund White accounts for Genet's enmity by instead characterizing his turn toward anti-imperialism as simply a, quote, sturdier platform from which to attack French society. He also insists that Genet was already considering the question of revolution at the time of this writing in the late 1940s. Regarding that time, he wrote, quote, Although Genet was wrestling with his new sympathies for communism, he remained essentially anarchic, antisocial, 
inassimilable. His interest then and later in revolutionary activity had little to do with parties or institutions, but everything to do with the messianic power, terror, and the attempt to introduce the worm to the fruit. Though he spent his later decades traveling and conspiring with various avowed revolutionaries, Genet eschewed the label for himself. His concerns, though at times intertwining with those of revolutionaries, were different. Even Laroche had to admit, when citing the remarkable interview that Genet gave to Hubert Fichte, that, quote, as a man of revolt, Genet cannot join revolutionary groups, the Panthers, the PLO, or any other. And even if he is with them, he is alone. His revolution is isolated because it is made of bodies. These bodies are not those of the Palestinians, but the result of events. The event of a body is solitude. Genet turns away from the revolution an empty word over which the great powers fight, to consider the revolutions of each person, experienced through the body as an event. Genet's introduction of worm to fruit then takes the form of an abrupt disruption, a pause or opening wherein to explore the insurgency of the body, each body, in singular revolt. If Genet's insurgency began long before 1968, and if his early commitments to crime and revolt endured long after, then we are called to read his supposed political works in a new light. How, for example, does this text about the power of a prisoner's writing augment and complicate his communiques in solidarity with George Jackson and other Black liberation prisoners? What does his deification of inmates accused of killing guards in prison, as in the Miracle of the Rose, tell us about his later years spent agitating for the freedom and mourning the death of Jackson, charged with the same crime? Rather than the distinct and opposed figures of Genet the criminal and Genet the revolutionary, we see instead Genet who disorders. His stance disrupts on many levels. His life testifies against the possibility of progressive reform of criminal children. His words obstruct the supposed transition from criminal to proper revolutionary. And finally, he intervenes into the conversation of systemic reform in the present. While the question of the reformation, even abolition, of this country's monstrous prison system has reached all the way to the halls of power and the streams of the spectacle, Genet insists on other questions. He explicitly criticizes those who wish to, quote, win souls back to society. He laments the banal life to which reform damns the child criminals. He laughs at those who desire to safeguard moral purity and offer pity to children who want none. He emphasizes the futility of society's attempts to, quote, eliminate or render harmless the elements that tend to corrode it. Genet asks us to imagine a hostility toward prison that doesn't proliferate it, in some affirmation of the society which mandates imprisonment, a refusal of control that doesn't diffuse control through all of life. He reminds us that, quote, whoever by gentleness or privileges tries to attenuate or abolish revolt destroys all his chances to be saved. Against the well-intentioned reformers, the future architects of more sinister houses of reform, Genet maintains his enmity. This enmity in Genet's writing is coded as evil, his code word for an ethics of the outside, of rebellion. Genet admires criminal children precisely for the recognition of their roles as adversaries of society, their ardor for evil. Quote, evil, I mean, just this will this audacity to follow a destiny opposed to all the rules. This evil is a secret, the children's secret, but can be shared between them and used to forge lasting bonds of friendship and insolence and joy. The criminal children conspire in an, quote, adventure against the rules of the good, and Genet remains their accomplice. This conspiracy signifies a lovely courage and Genet remains loyal to this sign.
enmity, evil, the revolution of each body, obstruction of progress, a refusal of the terms of the game. A mode is emerging here, a mode hostile to reconciliation, a magical mode. Those familiar with Genet's depiction of Maitre in The Miracle of the Rose will surely have grasped the magical nature of his memory of the place. When he writes of it, he writes as a mystic. He writes of love put through ordeal, of enchanted potions, of a secret world of childhood populated by monks, witches, shamans, and deities. In his book, time opens up and flows in many directions. Images of the distant past permeate the less distant and the present. He declares writing an act of worship, a devotion to the figures of his past, he sings an evocation of memory so as to have a clearer, more naked view of life. The criminal child offers a sharper focus of this mystical image. Here, Genet details some of the workings of his own internal cosmology, the rites and methods of his unique magical system. Genet reveals a system of initiation, not into an order, but into an adventure, one ineffable to the uninitiated, but shared between himself and other youthful offenders. Quote, the young criminal already refuses being so indulgently understood, and the solicitude of this understanding on the part of society against which he has revolted by committing his first crime, having at fifteen or sixteen, or even earlier, come of age in a way that the good people will still not have done at sixty. Genet elucidates a storybook feeling, a desire for self-projection into the, quote, most magnificent, the most audacious, ultimately the most perilous life that underwrites a young criminal's coming of age. Their initiation forces open the door onto forbidden places, lovely landscapes. Genet's criminal writes his corporeal and metaphysical breaking and entering, announce a, quote, young sovereign taking possession of a new realm. In having the audacity to free himself of a state of torpor, the audacity to break the all-powerfulness of the world, he enters into other worlds, hidden worlds, of numinous forces and multifold potentials. In the introductory pages of the Thief's Journal, Genet writes, Quote, with fantastical care, jealous care, I prepared for my adventure as one arranges a couch or a room for love. <laughs> and correspondingly, in The Criminal Child, he details that ritualistic care. To the initiated, he offers a profound instruction, quote, dress in outfits of dread and ignominy. Robe yourself in codes and attire that mock the empty ritual of courts and tribunals. Perfume yourself in the secret odors discovered in criminal ritual work. Forge and carry weapons, psychic weapons and metal ones. Weapons all the more powerful for their deviation from intended purposes, their profanation. Carry these close and conceal them under your mattress at night. Arm yourself with these in pursuit of criminal manifestations yet unimagined. Learn the names of your adversaries, of the sights which you must have overcome. St. Maurice, St. Hilaire, Belle Isle, Is, Anain, Montesson, Maitre, King County Juvenile Detention Center, juvenile hall, and commit them to memory, charge them with meaning, weigh them with terror, project them onto destiny, develop subtle argots, secret languages, keep them hidden from the authorities, sing songs of evocation, obscene complaints, oppose your language to the language of society, Pay attention to signs and sigils carved and painted onto walls. M.A.V. Mort au vache. Death to cops. B.A.A.D.M. Bonjour aux amis de malheur. Greetings to friends of misfortune. <laughs> and read these as you'd read inscriptions on the walls of an ancient temple. 
in them, sense the mystery of the past, but also the curve of your own destiny. More than anything, arm yourself with memory, memory of the now abolished places of your youth, wherein you first found power, memory of the childhood which is dead and of the poetic powers which accompanied it, memories of those who populated that secret world, that fabulous hell. Speak the names of the dead in order to speak the world of death, the kingdom of darkness. Carve onto a wall the mantra, Just as I am guarded by a prison door, so my heart guards your memory. Swear an oath not to let your childhood escape. Do not live a moment on earth without, at the same time, living in a secret domain. Let what has been destroyed carry on, continue in time. Guard it. Bring it with you wherever you go. Trace it up through the roots into the vegetative reality of each present moment. Find those who harbor the same memories. Build conspiracy between you. Let the honesty of your memories, the honesty of remembrance of paradise, build unbreakable bonds between you. The youth prison is Janae's fountain of memory, but each of us has our own clandestine world into which we were initiated as youth. It was there in those spaces that we learned magic as a force of liberation, self-creation, and world-building. Though our childhoods are gone, we can access that space again in remembrance and invocation. He instructs us to find or build a psychic space, a space brought to life by the comings and goings of our memory, our youth, and the creative urge. He advises us to create a corner of the world whose images live in our very souls, an ideal and cruel place situated deep in the child's heart, and to project the image of that inner space onto the brick-and-mortar walls of this world. Project the desire buried in your heart and in the hearts of the child criminals. Dwell in this internal garden, this internal theater, the space of love and war and dreams of escape. Find others who have been there and live together in accordance with its ways. Build your inner temple here and consecrate it to amorous passion. In this temple, you can now face your ordeal. Here, you cross a blazing fire and come back as someone else. Let the names committed to memory evoke all their violence, their force, their virility for it is indeed that which children wish to conquer. Their demand is that the ordeal be terrible. In this space, find the strength to face any test, brawls, billy clubs, dormitories, silences, prayer, punishment, clogs, scorched feet, marches in the sun, cold water, whatever disciplinary regime. We must remember that miracle recorded by Genet wherein Harkamon, condemned to death for murdering a prison guard, transfigured his chains into a garland of roses, one of which Genet clipped and concealed. We must recall his ecstasy shot through with a slight trembling, with a wave frequency that was alternate and simultaneous fear and admiration in witnessing such a miracle. As we imagine him holding the rose, we can hear the instruction articulated by contemporary practitioners of the ordeal path, such as Raven Caldera, who writes, quote, Take the rose into your hands and squeeze the thorns until your hands bleed even as you smell the scent of Aphrodite. When you understand why there is no contradiction there, the first step of the path will open to you. Janae's ordeal path individuates those who walk it. It must be faced in solitude, alone, unnameable and unnamed. In this namelessness, the ordeal seeker is charged with, quote, an even more dangerous power. In this state, Genet witnessed miracles, an entire secret life, gardens, monsters, deserts, fountains, 
found within the most minute secret spaces of the solitary heart. He gestures toward the possibility of emerging purified from such solitude. White, recognizing the incompatibility between self-exploration and conformism, affirms the necessity of individuation within Genet's system. Quote, Cruelty and violence are the poetic expression of the youngster's affirmation of evil and rebellion. If they had been obedient and had acquiesced to the prison system, submission would have led to the extinction of their individual differences, whereas rebellion sharpens their individuality. Instead of being interchangeable sheep, each is a distinct hero. Finally, since for Genet, crime itself is beautiful, he supports the cruelty of the unreformed prison system because it turns youngsters into hardened criminals. Supports, White's word, doesn't quite fit here. Genet is explicit in his enmity toward this society, its prisons surely included. He sees the prison as an obstacle to be overcome in a path of criminal becoming, a path of individuation. This is the folly of trying to read him as the, quote, political Genet. To say that Genet supports, or doesn't, any given state policy, enmeshes his words in a political mode befitting the text at hand. Genet neither supports the prison nor desires to reform it. He seeks to escape it and into the nocturnal part of man which cannot be explored, where one can only enter if one is armed if one is coded, if one is covered with all the ornaments of language. His ritual work prepares the initiate to enter this nocturnal space. Here one may find the jewels with which to encrust a crown, such as described in Miracle of the Rose. Here is the heaven he speaks of, the one he creates for himself and to which he is devoted. Here are the depths of the self, stirred by feelings of love, both violent and mystic. Chenet populates his nocturnal heaven with spirits, demons, deities, ancestors, and figures from his past, with blue eagles carved across their chests, youths who stand, quote, the way Mercury is depicted. His inner space is nourished by solitude and dreams of escape. For him, the writings of a prisoner are uniquely positioned to create such an internal cosmology. Dreams are nursed in darkness. Quote, those who are sentenced to death for life know that the only means of escaping horror is friendship. By abandoning themselves to it, they forgo the world, your world. They raise friendship to so high a plane that it is purified and remains alone, isolated from the creatures who fathered it, and friendships. On this ideal level, in the pure state, as it must be if the lifer is not to be carried away by despair, as one is said to be carried off with all the consequent horror by galloping consumption, friendship becomes the individual and very subtle sentiment of love which every predestined man discovers in his own hiding places for his inner glory. Living in so restricted a universe, they thus had the boldness to live in it as passionately as they lived in your world of freedom, and as a result of being contained in a narrower frame, their lives became so intense, so hard, that anyone, journalists, wardens, inspectors, who so much glanced at them was blinded by their brilliance. Their audacity to live, and to live with all one's might, within the world whose only outlet is death, has the beauty of the great maledictions. For it is worthy of what was done in the course of all the ages by the mankind that had been expelled from heaven. And this, in effect, is saintliness, which is to live in according to heaven, in spite of God. A perverse heaven, a nocturnal dreamscape, an internal door opened onto the dangerous and marvelous. This is where Genet found the walls crumbled, time turned to dust. This text was censored, nearly forgotten, and has, until now, remained untranslated. It was forced into a sort of exile, 
and we have taken autonomous measures to bring it back, to will it into existence. This is not unlike the clandestine publication of Genet's early novels, each initially smuggled from prison, published without imprint or publisher information, and circulated illicitly with much scandal. There's a long tradition of pirated editions of Genet's work. Years before Our Lady of the Flowers was published in English, an unpermitted edition was made available under the title The Gutter in the Sky. <laughs> On the dust jacket of that illegal edition is a lovely note from Richard Wright declaring, Genet has created a world that is outside of this world. He is a magician and an enchanter of the First Order. Diane de Prima in Recollections of My Life as a Woman recalls, We did a small run of Jean Genet's La Condamnée à Mort, put into English by me and Alan, and Brett, and Harriet Romer. Alan's method of translating Genet was to pick up French gay hustlers on 42nd Street and bring them back to Cooper Square to help with slang. A great pickup line, no? Come on with me, baby, and help me translate Genet. <laughs> We did a bilingual edition and had to pirate the French, as Gallimard owned the rights. They sent us an acid letter at some point. I am not sure who got the letter, as we purposely left publisher and place off the title page, just as the alchemical logo of Poets Press, a dragon eating its tail, flanked by the sun and the moon. The very poems de Prima mentions were first printed underground by Genet at his own expense. It is only fitting to steal the words of a text by a writer whose rights have always disregarded rights, whose practice consistently involved the theft of the written word. Genet said that the unwelcomed word is the means by which poetry escapes its prison. As a poet and also an enemy, he affirms the use of power of poetic weaponry. He speaks from the shadows and into the void. He stays at the edge of night and writes only for those beautiful, criminal, unrepentant who can hear him. The totality of Genet's work, and the criminal child especially, consists of unwelcome words that nevertheless forced open the door onto the world, a long and arduous poem of the truest sort. Pimps and queens and criminals Beautiful.